Can you hear me? Awesome. Thank you. I, I know it's incredibly tempting to do something else at 530 <laughs> when the pub crawl starts, everything else. So by round of applause, good reinvent so far? Awesome, awesome. So my name is Larry Gilreath. I am a principal security specialist SA covering what we call our global accounts with Amazon Web Services. This talk, if hopefully you guys are all here for it, is called Moving from the Shadows to the Throne. And I wanna take a minute to just really frame the conversation. And let's start by actually taking on a little bit of the blame. So, the rise of shadow IT is actually my fault and your fault. I, I won't take it all on my own. But what, what happens is we introduce systems. Something goes wrong with that system. That system, that thing that went wrong now becomes identified as a risk. So we introduce a process or a mechanism to actually try to mitigate that risk. And then of course that can get turned into a security control and then we need to have some way to actually monitor the state of that control. And so as more things happen, more mechanisms and processes get put in place, more controls get created, more people we need to handle event management, the process to actually provision resources continues to go up. The time to deliver goes from hours or days to months. A round of applause, who's ever had to wait longer than seven days to get a server? Yeah. <laughs> and then you get to a point where you have these touch points with security reviews that now become more of a blocker to the process. And so everyone who clapped and said, I've waited longer than seven days for a server, by round of applause, how many of you thought, man, I can do this so much faster on my own if IT would just get out of the way? Yeah. And guess what? That's what the business does. The business says, you know what? I understand that IT has all the focus on this hardware, on this process to help mitigate that risk, but I, I just don't think what I'm doing is gonna introduce that much more risk. So I'm just gonna go over here where there is no focus on me, no light, in the shadows, and start doing my own little IT thing. Because I, I got my own budget, I have my own competitive needs to beat the competition. I have ideas that can help actually drive my line of business. And so I'm gonna to continue to function in the shadows. And that's where we get with a lot of shadow IT. And then this happens. How much you wanna bet that that shadow IT guy who built that database called Central IT immediately and said, oh my gosh, <laughs> Little Bobby Drop Tables just brought our whole system down. Can you help me? <laughs> this is what happens when shadow IT is allowed to just run and run and run. Eventually, because they don't have the focus, they don't have the processes, they don't have the mechanisms, something's gonna go wrong. And there's a greater chance that when it goes wrong, it could be catastrophic. So what do we do? Do we slow things down? Well a lot of enterprises are still asking that fundamental question. Can I move faster and still stay secure? The answer is yes. AWS has a lot of tooling, a lot of capability in the platform to actually help you move faster and stay secure. So this evening, instead of me touting all the cool stuff we can do, I wanted to bring Vinay from Cisco. He's walked through this journey and I wanted to give you the opportunity to hear his story and the process that he went through to ensure that his company can move faster and stay secure. Mr. Vinay. Thank you, Larry. So what the, the key things which we are going to learn here, as Larry was saying, me as a security person within Cisco, my goal is to keep Cisco secure, right? Key, key things which, we, which is going to be takeaways for all of you. One is how within Cisco we created a concept of what we call security guardrails. I'll, I'll 
walk you through that, right? Those are the things which we want to build for multiple teams across Cisco. Second thing for us was how we automated security because security is always thought of as a slow down thing, right? Or an inhibitor for moving fast. So we will see how we did within Cisco, how we automated a lot of those guardrails to make the teams move even quicker. A third thing is how we are building the team, which is continuously improving it with the metrics because we want to give those metrics back to the each team. Uh, back on how they can secure it. So another thing I want to give you a context as we start, right? So Cisco's context is much bigger. We had multiple accounts, right? And I'll talk about how many accounts, right? And for a security person, want to do security for all these accounts across Cisco. So just, just looking at our outline, I'll talk about our journey. We'll, we'll go into the security guardrails, but what the those fundamental things which we want everyone to do correctly when they are using AWS. And then we will go into the automation pieces and I'll talk about three main capabilities which we automated and that one of the big learning for us was they were done very quick fashion. We used actually AWS tools and other things to automate it. I'll talk about how we automated those, right? So we'll go, go about how we are auditing continuously, we are monitoring and logging continuously for accounts, as well as we are doing the vulnerability management on all those accounts. And the other thing which, which I, we are going to talk about is how we do the metrics, measurements, and giving it back, and then we'll talk about over this journey, what's our lessons learned. And when I say this journey, this is like last six to nine months for us, right? Which is probably not long in Cisco's term, but we did a lot of things during that. <clears throat> so what, what exactly, when I say, what exactly is Cisco's journey, right? As a, as a person in Cisco's information security team, right? I see this change happening over the last few years where number of engineering teams, we call it business units within Cisco, started moving into their workloads over cloud, even Cisco's IT was seeing some opportunities, both as part of innovating themselves, as well as the tools they were bringing in, they were already hosted in the cloud. So we, we had an increasing uh, shift towards the public cloud, which probably should be not a news for any of us here, right? Uh, another thing which we saw is Cisco acquires a lot of companies. When we acquire a company, it's already have a big footprint in the cloud, right? So we need to tackle the cloud problem. And when we started looking in the beginning of this year, 2017, and actually I worked with Larry, uh, one of the first engagements, we were actually a little bit surprised when we found there are already 700 plus accounts across Cisco who were already using AWS in one form or the other, which is a large number, right? And for us, the problem comes, how do we ensure Cisco's workload now securely run on AWS? That's what we are going to talk about. So just looking at how security has changed along with the cloud, right? So again, I wouldn't spend a lot of time, but this is very obvious things, things moving from data centers to the cloud. From DevOps, I'll talk about DevSecOps, right? Because DevOps has been kind of the methodology being used, but how we insert security. And we will learn like through guardrails, through automation, how we are able to insert security in the DevOps cycles. And you change from your security, which is a document to you build, as a security team, we started building security as a code, right? We give you modules, just insert them, they will do security for you. It's not those requirements, 50, 60 requirements each team needs to be uh, doing. And then from manual reviews to the doing it automated reviews, we'll, we'll, we'll see that how we are running this automated checks that runs every night on 350 plus accounts, right, of Cisco and brings us data. And then we, we need our uh, security to be continuous real time because the reality is teams are using DevOps. They are doing multiple releases every day, every week. So as this information security team, we cannot cope up with them doing assessment, right? As soon as you finish assessment, it's already old because they just uh, put a new version or put a new release. So let, let, let's start with Fundamentally, what are the, um, in this learning, what are the major parts of it, right? And when we'll go into each of the part. The first part for us is establishing the enterprise uh, agreement with AWS. Now, why it is important, right? Like, like I talked about, when we started looking into AWS deeply, when we saw that there are already 700 plus accounts, all these accounts were having one-off agreements with AWS, right? So that, that, that gives us, 
as, as Cisco being a big enterprise, not only it gives us some disadvantage from the billing negotiations and others, also we want to have a certain SLA, certain things done on security correctly, right? So we did actually sit with the, uh, the AWS team and we said, okay, we need to now move into enterprise agreement. They definitely want to do that, right? So it's a win-win for AWS as well as Cisco. So we started looking into, there are a couple of things which we added in the AWS agreement. If you have, many of you may have looked into whatever, 15 or 20 page of their agreement. We looked in from the legal aspect, from new privacy, GDPR coming in. We wanted ha having certain breach notifications, certain SLAs on vulnerability management, certain certifications which were very important for Cisco because there were certain offerings which were FedRAM compliant, certain offerings which need ISO and others. We wanted much more uh, stricter uh, lines on, on our contract about AWS keeping those for multiple years, right? So we, we looked at some tweaking those, and we established the enterprise agreement with the AWS, right? And then we tried to bring in all the accounts into that enterprise agreement. Another key learning, which was not obvious for us, uh, was that we established the enterprise agreement, but not automatically all these 700 accounts fall into that because they already had the agreement, right, one off. They have to opt in, right? So one of the things which we have been doing for last, we have around, out of 700, we have more than 500 accounts which has opted in, right? So we are still working with that. That's kind of one learning for us. The second thing, which is defining the security guardrails, right? As a security person, now agreement is there, right? But that's not going to protect you. Now you need to look at what are the different workloads. We have teams who are having production workloads. We have teams which are having tests and other workloads. How we create the guardrails. And we'll actually do a deep dive into the guardrails. And then guardrails, and then we automate it, right? We take the guardrails. We don't want each team to be now taking the guardrails and try to do it themselves. If we have 700 accounts, we can it's better for us to automate it for all of them, right? So we'll talk about that too. And apply security, and the other thing which we saw is if we have 700 accounts and we have now enterprise agreement and we know that there's going to be more movement into AWS, we want to automate all these guardrails. We want to actually have the account being provisioned and all these security things which we want, fundamental things, we want it to be applied and the account to be given to the team, right? And the risk scoring and metrics, that's another learning for us because you know, just doing security and it just does the check, how do you actually improve, right? You need to take those risks, what your findings and other things and make it very actionable. I'll show you how we try to make it actionable so the team knows this is exactly what they need to do to fix those things and they go and they get better scoring on metrics on their account. Now, let's build upon what we call the security guardrails. So as I said, right, so problem for us was, now we have 700 accounts with different security postures, different security needs. Are there some fundamental things which we want all accounts to be doing correctly, right? Now the good thing about AWS is it gives you so many security features. It's overwhelming security features, right? If you look at key management, there are three or four different kind of key management. You can do a transparent one, you can do a cloud HSM one, you can do a manage your own keys. So similarly, you could have ACLs done in a different ways, network ACLs, VPCs, security groups, what is right, right, for the team. So we, we selected like 10 areas where we said, okay, each of the area we are going to look deeper and these are the fundamental things which we want teams to be doing in each of those areas. So those, those are the, what we call 10 guardrails and we'll go through one by one each of them. And then the other thing which you see in this picture here is our goal is that a new account request comes for Cisco we apply that automation of security what we want in each of those accounts, right? And that needs to be done in a very quick fashion. It's not, shouldn't be a manual thing, it's just automated. And the account gets provisioned back to the team. Going back to what Larry was talking about, how you do security with speed. We don't want a one week, we want probably 10 minutes account goes. The first thing, right, what's the first thing which we, from a security professional, and many of you probably are, right? What's the first thing you want to do correctly is always identity, right? I always believe first thing is identity, right? If you look at attacks and other things, that's what, if identity is not right, then everything is all 
meaningless, right? So we wanted to look at the identity postures which AWS gives, especially the identity and access management, the key management uh, of your API keys. We looked into all those aspects, right? And we said, okay, there is certain rules for privileged users, certain accounts which are going to be production accounts, which needs to be have MFA enabled. We have certain key rotation policies which we are enforcing, as well as we are enforcing uh, how much will be the single sign-on which we're going to be talking about, right? So we took identity and we had like seven or eight different guidelines on IEM. This is the minimal things each account needs to be doing on IEM. Second thing for us was jump host, right? And this was some of the experience when I was working with some of the Cisco workloads on some of the Cisco offerings called IntraCloud offering. That was the number one issue I saw, right? When engineers who were good engineers who were very used to building products in internal labs, they try to put their uh, product into the cloud. They, they don't realize that they're opening the whole VM to the word and keeping a weak password, right? So we, we wanted teams to have by default a jump host or a bastion host provided so that they don't do that mistake, right? By default, all even if they install a VM, they will always come through a jump host or a bastion host. So we want to establish a bastion host in each account and it has to be a default. A third thing which we looked into was the hardening of the operating systems. So now the good thing about AWS again is it gives you hundreds or thousands of combinations of OSs you can put in when you start a EC2 instance, right? But that's probably from security, that's too much, right? And within Cisco, we already have established hardening guidelines, hardening, hardened VMs. We wanted to take those hardening things and apply to this, right? So we wanted to provide those hardened images to the account. And w one of the, um, one of the uh, uh, benchmark we use within Cisco, and I'm not sure if you're able to read it, CIS, right? So that's the industry benchmark. I want to establish that, that each workload you're running, you need to be using a hardened image. So we, we'll be taking the questions at the end, right? So I'm planning to finish 15 minutes earlier, so if you have questions, just hold on, okay? Um, the fourth thing for us, obviously, Cisco being a networking company, we wanted the network to be done correctly, right? We want to have a correct VPCs, ACLs, and other things. So we wanted to put some guidance on what to be done there and what are the correct things there. Now the next one, right, vulnerability management. If you look at like how today things get compromised or breached, right? The most common pattern that happens, a hacker doesn't have to do a lot, right? Uh, if you look at some of the recent one, right? The hacker just looks at, okay, you are running a vulnerable package and you haven't patched it for a number of years, it's exposed outside. They, anyone can see it, right? You probably didn't fix it and you, 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 uh, the hacker is going to go and attack and compromise your uh, environment, right? So we wanted to do the vulnerability management correctly. We wanted to insert, and Cisco has been using Qualys has been one of our partner and one of our enterprise tool for vulnerability management. We want to insert vulnerability management capability into each account. Right? By default, we want to find any issues before bad guys find it, right? That's kind of, that to me is a winning game. The next one is the logging and monitoring, right? Because we can do all the things correctly, but we all know as a security professional, you can never achieve 100% security, right? So it, it, it's the reason this building has cameras, right? Because some things will go wrong, right? And you should be always go back and look at the cameras and see, okay, someone was trying to steal this or let's replay the thing, right? So that's where the, what's the importance of logging and monitoring for us, right? And if, if you're like in any of the industry which requires certain compliances, that's a very required thing, right, for those compliances. So we wanted to do the security logging correctly, and we looked through the AWS, what we can do at the AWS layer, right? There were three areas which we identified. We wanted to get the logs for all the API identity access that you get from CloudTrail. That was our number one thing which we want to enable, right? Then NetFlow logs, right, or logs about network and how, how the data is flowing, right? That's the VPC flow logs. We looked into it, we, we said, okay, we want to enable those on all accounts. And the third one is what we call the elastic ELB logs, right? Because most of the applications are using ELB load balancer as your front end for HTTP requests, right? We wanted to go at the API or web tier, right? That gives us a web tier um, visibility into each of the accounts. So we covered web tier, we covered the network tier, as well as we covered some of the API access, right? That gives us, I wouldn't say 100%, a considerable portion of logs which we want to collect, right, and keep it. So we, we kind of established the guidance on these logs to be enabled. There are more detailed guidances we have on how you encrypt the log buckets, how you actually make it immutable so that you cannot delete it and other things, right, which we'll show you a little bit more. 
What's the next thing was creating the account level encryption key, right? As I talked about, AWS gives you so many different ways, right? So teams can get confused which encryption is correct. Is transparent encryption good enough or do I need to have cloud HSM or do I need to bring my own key, which is the good one, right? So we looked at all, all those things and for us, since all accounts were at the different level, right? Obviously, having your own key is probably the best solution, but that's probably most cumbersome for the teams and it's complex and it slows them down, right? So we looked at, okay, at least we want each team to be enabling their account level encryption key, right? So that was our guardrail on that, right? And then if accounts have more security needs, they can do better than that, but that's a minimal bar we established for those accounts. And next one was hardening the AWS core components, right? Not only if you look at number five there, right, not only vulnerabilities in the components which team is bringing in, right, we want the AWS services to be configured correctly. If you ask me what's the number one thing, right, which I see teams not doing it, and that also goes back to what you may have heard on all the breaches or all the things related to the AWS S3 buckets, right, so teams don't do configure those. I wouldn't call this AWS fault because S3 buckets have so many different combinations of uh, configurations, right? And teams may not know what's the right configurations, right? So we, we establish, we look at what are the most common AWS components teams will be using, ELB, S3 buckets, right? DynamoDB, RDS, and others. So we establish the configurations and what are the right security configurations which we want each team to be doing. And the next one was trusted security uh, advisor, right? So trusted advisor is one of the service Hopefully everyone knows, right? So you get a free one when you get an account, right? But that has only three to five checks. And when we looked at the trust advisor, it has around 20 checks, right, the enterprise version. And we did actually negotiate as part of the enterprise agreement with Cisco, being an enterprise customer to enable enterprise level trust advisor for all the accounts, right? Because it, it is giving me automated 15, 20 checks for free, right? So I wanted to take leverage of that. Other thing which you will see is the enterprise version uh, of the trust advisor not only gives you multiple checks, that also gives you automation abilities, right? So API access is available not with the basic one, with the enterprise one, right? So we figured that out during our earlier establishment and we made it kind of, everyone gets the enterprise tr uh, trusted advisor with all the 20 or so checks. The next one for us was uh, uh, the tagging, right? So another interesting thing, right, which we learned is the attribution, right? If you're a security pro pro professional, you probably know what's the attribution problem, right? I'll just uh, ex give, give you one example, right? So one of the biggest issues is if we have 700 accounts and thousands of VMs, let's say one VM is not configured or is compromised, how I quickly go and attribute, okay, this is Vinay's VM, I, he needs to actually go and do something about it, right? So we should be able to quickly figure it out who owns it. And what's the purpose of this VM? Maybe there's a, there's a S3 bucket which is sitting out, sitting com, uh, with, with the insecure permissions, but it just has a test data or public data that may be okay, right? Versus the S3 bucket sitting with Cisco Confidential. So we wanted to use those tags, right, for data level uh, tagging for confidentiality level so that we can find out. We also want to use those tags to figure it out how I reach to a Cisco person quickly, right? So we leverage the tagging to do the attribution. So we established that, right? Another thing which we uh, identified now as a security person, I want to make it easier, faster for the teams, right? And that's where we looked into the audit capability within each of the account, right? And that's where we looked into, and uh, we are going to talk about the automation. Our automation is a lot based on creating a audit security role, which is the already existing role, and giving it to the security team so that we can go and do a periodic automated audits in each of those accounts. So these were our 10 guardrails, right, which we created, but they're still at the level of these are the guidelines. Each team needs to be doing it, right? So we'll talk about how we automate those. The other thing along with that which becomes important for us is now this is Cisco being a big enterprise and many of you part of bigger enterprise, how we connect it with the rest of the enterprise, right? So we can't just leave each account alone in its own silo, right? So we, looked, we, we talked about the identity. So we looked at, okay, how we, we integrate our identity back with Cisco's own identity, because as an employee of Cisco, right, we have identity, Active Directory, and others, right, so we integrated single sign-on for all those 
right? And the green one is saying that when we established the guardrails, we worked with the Cisco's IT to start building that. There are five or six things which we identified early on, right? The green one actually we completed probably in a few, few weeks to a few months, right? And there are a few still in work which I'll talk about. Second one which we looked at is the security logs, right? And that's, again, where we wanted to take those logs. Now, good thing is each of the account is keeping those logs, but just keeping those logs who is actually doing the active monitoring and who knows what's going on there, right? So we wanted to take a feed from the log and give it to our incidents response team and figure it out how they can figure, uh, they can identify any breaches, any bad things happening on these accounts, right? And the next one is the vulnerability uh, results. This is our audit and automated things, right, which we want to run every night and go back and check. The two things which are work in progress, so we did identify that encryption at the account level is okay, but that's not our main goal or ultimate goal, right? Cisco being, since we will have number of our customer data, other data, we believe that we need to be managing our own keys, right? And, but we want to establish a vault, right? So there's a work in progress, that's why it's blue. We'll be establishing a vault setup that could be used at the enterprise level, right? I, we don't want to leave it just vault for each account. We want to have a vault which can do for 700 accounts so that we can just get a uh, efficiency of scale there. Similarly, the direct connectivity, right? Because now multiple teams who are either using cloud or migrating to cloud still have certain applications to certain labs still within Cisco's DMZ and others. So they, they want a model how we connect it, right? And not only connect from there, they need to be connecting to other hybrid cloud scenarios, other clouds, right? So we wanted to build a, we have now multiple one-off solutions, I'll call it. It's not that we don't connect, right? But we wanted to build a solution which is automated and which is all vetted out, right? That's another thing which, which is still work in progress for us. Now, how we take this and automate it, right? So we, we talked about integrating back into that, right? So now there, there are a couple of, this is our now the second step, which is our automation journey, right? So what, what I just talked about, establishment of guardrails and enterprise agreement, probably took us a quarter or less than a quarter, right? Then we started building the automation for the teams, right? Because that's, that's where the rubber meets the road, right? Just putting a document with guardrails, I know that it's not going to go much, right? So what you see in this picture, as I talk about our automation, right, and the good thing about this automation is uh, I was myself surprised, right, we had around three engineers, developers who were able to do all this automation in probably five to six months, right? So we'll talk about what exactly is this automation. So what, what you see on, uh, let, let's first start understanding the two different parts in this picture, right? What you see in the blue here on the uh, right hand side, right, so which, which is the tenant account. These are all the Cisco accounts, the 700 accounts which I talked about, right. So th those accounts, right, on the red, red side are the two accounts, right, which we have from the security infosec team. One account, we build it to use it for the nightly audit purpose, right, we call it the CSP. CSP stands for Continuous Security Buddy, right, so that's our internal name for the tool uh, which we build for automation. So, um, and then second account which we use for incidence response, right, that's focused on uh, handling the logs and uh, figuring out any, any breaches or any, any indications of that, right. Uh, so so th those are two accounts which we are using, right? There are four functionalities which we are going to be talking a uh, little deeper about, right? One functionality is a continuous security validation or audit of each account, right? And we will go into a little bit, a uh, little bit click on each of them, we'll go into the architecture of it at a higher level, right, how we are able to do that. Second thing is getting those logs, coming to this log account, right, so that we can, we can actually uh, analyze all the logs coming, right? Third thing is the single sign-on capability, which we briefly talked about, right? So we did actually integrate single sign-on, and that's one of actually the functionality, the number one I think, functionality which our Cisco teams love because they don't need to manage the IEM users, their credentials, they just use Cisco's own uh, identity, right? The passwords they are used to using internally. And then we, we took like, Number of teams actually started liking our validation results. They said, okay, you are running it nightly, but we want to even run it with our CICD pipeline even quicker, right? So we had ended up actually taking a number of our uh, audit rules and other things, converting into as a config rules and giving it in our internal GitHub so that you can run it on your own, right? And even converting them into the AWS config rules so that they can run it on their place. It's, it's like a exam, right? If, if I'm writing an exam and I already gave you a sample test, you can attempt it yourself and you know what you're going to score right before you sit for the exam, right? That, that's how those config rules are acting. 
So let, let, let's now do a deep dive into the audit part, right? This showing little architectural view of that, right? So a couple of things now you see. So I just kind of blew out the audit account, right? What are the main components of that, right? So one of the biggest thing for us, right? And it's, it's to me, it's not only a security story, right? It's how we are able to do things very quickly, right? When we looked into, we said, okay, we need to build the audit functionality. And we looked into putting our EC2 instances. And by the way, we said, okay, why do we need EC2 instances? We are running just a bunch of scripts to do the audit and checks. Why not we go and try Lambda and serverless, right? So our whole architecture of the audit account is based on just, we don't even have any EC2 instance, it's serverless. We do around 150 checks on each account, right? Those are all broken down into different Lambda functions that does, right, front end it with the API gateway that helps to trigger the events. We also wanted to quickly go with the database because number of our checks were having different formats and we were continuously adding checks, right? So we started with DynamoDB, one for scalability. Second thing is we are not bound to any different SQL, um, any table schema and other things, right? We add another validation text that has a different results. We don't need to worry about it, right? So DynamoDB helped us to scale very quickly. Um, the, what, what you see now in this picture, right, that we are able to actually run this every 24 hours, we trigger and it goes to all those accounts, Cisco accounts, right, because we already have a security audit role, it goes and runs those Lambda functions to do. That brings the results back, right, how do our, are the scoring in our assessment, right, and that brings back to the DynamoDB. One thing which we are doing today, right, because we are doing this internal uh, tool, right, in a very rapid format. We, we did like a startup fashion. We did an MVP release of that, right, and that's where we said, okay, now we need to push back the results, right? So we started with just sending them emails about this is how your score looks like, account looks like, right? But that was not our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal is what you see here is the integration back into the JIRA system because that's our internal risk management system. So we want, we are actually working on this, a work in progress, which is the lower part, using the Amazon's queuing service, right, to integrate back with the JIRA system. So now let's look at the next one, which is the deep dive into the Monitoring, logging and monitoring capability, right? So what do you see here? A couple of things, right? So security plays, right? So let, let's talk about first the security plays. So security plays are the things which are more, we, we as Cisco, we want, these are the things which we want to check all the time, right? So we created security plays, those are based on certain rules and other things based on the logs which we want to find out, right? So the, what you see here is five and our incidence response team is continuously adding more security checks and plays in it, right? So we wanted to look for any insecure um, services, we wanted to look at insecure authentication. Basically, if, if a team, uh, if someone is still using weak MFA or are using credentials and other things happening in the account. Any uh, log, log session means if any team goes and because even if we give these guardrails and the automation team has a root on their accounts, right? They can always go and switch off the cloud trail and other logs which we talked about, right? If we see that, right, we can quickly get notification. Any, any ACLs or permissive network, right? And any privileged account compromise, that's a big thing for us, right? So those are the things. And then team is continuously adding it, right? Now let's look at the architecture of the system, right? It's a very simple one because we just build it in a few months, right? So what you see is cloud trail, ELB, and VPC logs, right? So we, we did use CloudWash because one of the things which we learned is we don't want to take all the logs being generated and take it out from the account, right? We wanted to only have very small subset of logs which looks suspicious, which we want to bring in for more analysis, but we still want the teams to keep those logs. If something happens, if we have to do a breach identification or breach notification later on, we can go through the whole logs, right? So CloudWatch actually gives a filter of logs. Think of it out of 100 logs, it just gives two, three percent of logs back, right? Then it, it pushes to the, uh, to the our incidence response team account, right? Which is, we have a combination of Kinesis and Splunk. The reason we have Splunk, because Splunk has been our enterprise tool, right? And we have a lot of rules and place already coded in Splunk, right? So we use a combination of that to analyze those things, right? And trigger and work with any team if we see any compromise or anything's going wrong in any of our account. Now, along with that, right? So another thing which you see at the bottom here, right? So this is good, right? But security is always, right? Okay, what's, what's next is, is this, what would we, as part of our enterprise agreement, right? We worked with what should be the SLS. Many, many times we may not be able to find it, but 
AWS team may be able to find something wrong with our account. Some, they, they have a way to notify it, right? So we establish the whole model where they notify it, what's the SLA, what's the time, and all that, so that uh, team can take an action. So it, we, we do some action based on what AWS is telling us in a very fast manner versus what we can detect with our automation, right? So this, this actually runs in the real time. The audit one runs on the nightly basis. This is on the real time. The third thing which I'm going to talk about is the vulnerability scanning, right? As I talked about, uh, we use Qualys as our enterprise vulnerability scanning tool, right? So one of the things which we learned, right, when we started working on, and if you look at the guardrails, we wanted the, each Qualys VM to be sitting inside the account so that it's continuously scanning all the account. That's a good thing to do, right? But, but we identified there is a still a little bit of overhead there because those VMs, when we set it up for account, right, there is a manual thing required to set it up. And many times, team go and set up another VPC. We have to put another uh, thing or they ch change internal ACLs. The Qualys VM breaks, right? And then another thing which we identified as we were doing it, this is one of the use cases which came in as we were building the automation. We said, okay, we already have the elastic IP address for each account. We have an audit capability. We actually know that we can go in and do the surface identification we all already know, right? So, and if, if just from the security perspective, you always go for where is your maximum risk? Where exactly is your maximum risk? for the things which are exposed outside, those elastic IP addresses or things which are exposed outside. So I said, okay, if, if we already have these uh, exposed IP addresses surface for each of our account, which is 700 account and probably tens, and some, some accounts were even surprised, we have hundreds of elastic IP addresses, right? I have five or 10,000 I, uh, elastic IP addresses, which are Cisco-bound workloads, right? Why not I go and do a scanning of that, right? And since, if you understand how Qualys has a, uh, cloud-based scanning also, right? So in that case, I don't need to even wait for a scanner to be installed, right? If I know that this is a Cisco workload, I can just trigger that scan from outside. Now, one thing to keep in mind there is that we do need to notify AWS. If you look at the AWS agreement, right? We do need to notify AWS if we are scanning anything, right? So we worked with AWS, okay, we just thought AWS would have API for us to notify it. And that's one of the things AWS said, okay, this is the first team which is asking us an API for notification. You have a form we worked out as part of our, again, enterprise agreement that, okay, we are going to be telling you about all of our accounts and they are going to tell, give us a validation for next 90 days to go and you are allowed to scan your accounts, right, till they are still building on the APIs for us to notify it, right? So, so in a way, we notified the AWS saying that, okay, these are all of our accounts and we are going to be triggering a scan on them, right? So that, that's where we have the API which goes to the Qualys cloud and it says, okay, these are all six to 7,000 hosts across AWS different regions. Go and start scanning, right? So it goes and triggers the scan on each of these workloads, right? On a nightly basis. Another learning for us is it's kind of like we are finding the hosts are growing and one of the things which we are scaling out is we wanted it to be done every 24 hours, but it takes longer than that, right? So we are still working on, it takes around two to three days actually. There are so many hosts across the uh, different accounts for, um, to run, right? But now we are able to now gather those vulnerability scan results, right, at the automated way, and now start figuring out how we can start sending it back to the team. This is what is your external posture, external vulnerabilities of your accounts. <clears throat> The next thing for us, right, so we looked at all those automation, right, which probably gave us a quick start. And as you see, uh, what we tried to do as a security professional, we looked at what are the low-hanging fruits, right? So some of the things you will see there, I wouldn't say those are 100% of the things. They're probably 80-20 ratio. 80% of the things that would have taken us 20% time, right, given us much more benefit. Now, we had all these things going on, sitting in our DynamoDB. How do we send it back to the different teams? Because ultimately, the advantage of all this is if a team goes and fixes things, right? So one of the things which we started doing is automating sending these results back to the team, right? Because another thing which we are actually working on, ideally, as a security person, you may have said that, okay, I have a root on the account, I go and change them, right? And that, that's where sometimes there's a balance, right? We wanted to have a read audit only role currently with the account, right? So that we, if we, we are not going to mess up our right to your account, we'll tell you what to fix, right, quickly, or we'll block you. So, so few learnings here, right? Uh, if, if, you, if you look at, 
I'm purposely not showing the whole report here, right? But this is kind of currently in PDF format, and as, as I told you, we are working on integrating it with our Jira and other systems, right? So it goes into the each areas which which are important as part of our security guardrails, right? Like identity and access management. It does 150 or so checks across all those areas, right? So it will give you a scoring on each of your area for identity and access management. If you find certain accounts which haven't rotated the keys within 90 days or which has have the MFA enabled, right? We're going to give you a lesser score in that, right? So you get score for each of that, similarly network, S3 bucket, tagging, and other things, right? One of the things which we learned is, okay, we have a big report. We started giving a grading, right? So grading was another idea, just an idea that came, okay, why not we give a grade to the team? That actually changed the dynamics with us working, right? When a team gets a score, okay, why did I get a C on my AWS account, right? And okay, how can I move it to A, right? And they, we, we, we have the data for all the accounts. We have what we want them to be done correctly so we can correlate and say, okay, across your 700 or so account, this is where your security posture stands for, right? And that, that give, gives us a lot of leverage as a security team to drive certain things. A certain manager or director won't be happy when they say their seven accounts have bad grades, right? So now, now we talked about guardrails, right? So to me, it's important for any enterprise, like any work, to figure it out, what are your guardrails? And it may differ. It, you can use some of the things which we learn, right, and can put your own thoughts and own needs for your enterprise over that, right? We talked about how we automated it, right? Um, so what, what were the main benefits and lessons we learned out of that, right? So as I talked about, right, single sign-on. If I ask today with my team, that's the number one thing they like. They say, okay, I, don't need to, I have 120 users, now I don't need to manage their passwords, they can just single sign on back, right? S3 buckets, so here is kind of, I was reading, and if you know about Verizon and few other breaches that happen related to S3, right, it's all S3 configurations not done correctly, right? I was reading another article as I, as I was analyzing it, right? 7% uh, of S3 bucket, it claims, right, are con not configured correctly, right? So I don't know how much that 7% figure is correct, but we do see that in our accounts, in our scans, lot of issues related to the S3 buckets not set correctly. Now the good thing is we are finding it much quicker and notifying the team and get it fixed right before uh, anyone else finds it. Risk reporting, right, I showed you the grading system which we created. That definitely kind of changed the dynamics work with the team. And they see a grade, right? They know that, okay, these were the things, and this is the scores. These are the areas they were getting less score. They can go and correlate it back, right? Tagging helped us to do the attribution. Because now if you have 700 accounts, we have tags, we can quickly figure it out which team owns a certain resource. Especially we talked about our uh, <clears throat> breach notification, our incidence response monitoring. That's the number one thing the team likes because it's already tagged, they find something issue, they can quickly figure it out who, who is the engineer or ops guy we need to be contacting, right? This thing doesn't look correct. <clears throat> and the other thing, right, for us was scaling, right? I talked about the architecture, right? We, it, it was just like, we, when we looked at, we need to build this, why we can use Lambda, we can use DynamoDB. We started doing it for two, three accounts, and soon within a month, we were doing it for 350 or 400 accounts, right? And we don't need to do any, any provisioning on our own. Lambda, DynamoDB just kind of scaled right to that. That, that was good eye-opening for us, actually, seeing some of the reality there. So now just to summarize what we talked about here, right? So uh, what I want you to take back, right? When, when you do an enterprise, right, definitely like the, what Larry and we started with, right, we want to do security in a faster way. Security needs to be, someone said that, why do we need brakes in the car, right? We need brakes not to slow you down. Actually, you can run your car faster if you have the brakes. If you don't have the brakes, you may not be able to go fast, right? So security needs to help teams to go faster, right? So as, as an enterprise, right, we learn by creating our security guardrails, I want you to go back and say, okay, what should be the things established for your accounts, right? Automation is the key, right, to move faster. We talked about automation, how we did it, right, and there are a few tools 
For us, the scaling was a good thing. We wanted to do it for Cisco specific thing. It's a constant thing, right? You have to constantly evolve. You see, so saw some patterns there. We, we didn't plan for the vulnerability management to be done externally, like what we are doing today, but we just learned that that's probably going to be most efficient, right? Similarly, the uh, scoring and other things we changed and tweaked, right? And not, not only how you do it, your threats and other things are going to be consistent out, right? You need to be ready, like the S3 buckets and others, you should be able to check quicker than your other competitors or bad guys checking it, right? So you need to be able to automate and give those metrics. Metrics, again, like I said, are important, right? Because measuring security, if you've been a security professional, is the hard thing, right? And with this particular automation, I was happy to show some metrics and show some results back to the teams. Now with that, I'll open up floor for questions and answers. If anyone has questions. Do we have mics or? Hey, uh, I, I was just wondering about uh, tagging, uh, and if you in, if you had uh, encountered any challenges with that across so many accounts to kind of keep towards um, a tagging standard, uh, and whether or not that slows any of the uh, efforts and stuff going on because uh, the more tags you have, uh, you, you know, kind of it, it it slows down any creation of resources because there's okay. there, there, there's more fields to. Yeah. So, so the question is tagging, right? Did we face challenges with tagging? Yeah, we faced challenges with everything. Tagging was one of the things. So, uh, so one thing, right? Tagging slows down. I don't believe that, right? Some teams say that, but that's according to AWS documentation. Tagging should not be slowing down anything, right? So, one of the things which we said because we had number of tags, we had uh, four to five different tag fields which we want each team to be adding to S3 buckets. We actually mandated it for all S3 bucket and EC2 instances. You should be doing it for other resources, but those are mandatory, right? So we, we said that one, one of the things which we learned for the accounts which were already established, we didn't have any tags, right? They said, okay, we, I have 400 resources. How will I tag and slow it down? We actually do did build some scripts for them. We said, okay, I have a script that will actually cause a default tag for all of them. Here's the Excel spreadsheet or CSV file. Just kind of because most of them will have same fields. For example, it's Cisco public information or Cisco confidential. They can just tweak it and, and rerun the script that just tags them, right? So, so first, just, just to kind of summarize my answer, I don't think tagging slows you down. We did find some teams being challenged. I have so many resources already. I've never been tagging it. How do I go and tag it? We gave, we built a script for helping them tagging it. To me, uh, the team started building that whole tagging thing in their cloud formation or Terraform templates itself, right? That's where teams are moving, right, uh, towards tagging. Good question. Any more questions? Were you able to replicate any of this to other platforms, or is all of this specific to AWS? Currently, it's specific to AWS, right? But we did get a request, right, from obviously there are few teams who have multi hybrid cloud or multi cloud strategies, right, who are working across multiple cloud providers. So we do have an internal request to do that, right? So now it, it's, it's all the balance, right? Where since AWS to me is the biggest chunk of where the teams are, but we, we do have plans actually next year to start looking into others and how we can take the guardrails and apply it to other cloud providers. Any more questions? If not, thanks a lot, and if you have questions, we can stay here for a few minutes, so you can come.